Okay, let's start. Uh, this means it's being live streamed. Got it. Okay. Father, would you like to? So we will start by uh, putting ourselves in the holy presence of God and understanding that as we come together, we pray that there will be greater understanding <clears throat> and openness amongst each and every one of us. So that as we continue in this way, we pray that we pray that we will be able to reach out to others and also to inspire them to greater heights. This we ask in your most precious name. Amen. Good evening and welcome everyone. It's good to see so many of you. And uh, in fact, I, I hope we can open up to more, but I don't know whether we will be able to do it or not. Teresa, sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, the link, I've just posted the link. It's live on YouTube now. Ah. So whoever was not able to join can watch it on YouTube. The, the link is in the chat, yeah? Um, YouTube. Okay, that, that's helpful because... So sorry about that, yeah. Because well, some people have said they registered but still cannot enter, so they feel a bit upset, yeah. Anyway, yeah, no. please, please send them the link. Thanks. Send them the link. They all Those who have got the link, ask them to go back on YouTube. Okay, sorry about it. Thank you so much. No. No. Where's the link? I don't see the link, YouTube. Unless it's not a professional account, I think it's up to, is it 500? Now that thing, after 100, nobody can no, yeah, no YouTube. Okay, YouTube link now. Very upset then. Yeah, I can get into the YouTube link. Huh? Ah. Thank you. Somebody got the link is in the the link is in the chat chat group. And there, I'm just no, yeah, no YouTube, okay, YouTube. Okay, listener. Okay. I'm just a listener. Yeah, I Gwen, uh, sorry, Gwen, did you send the link to Teresa? Have you? Yes, yes. It's known as Understanding Freedom of Religion under the Malaysian Federal Constitution. And uh, it started streaming two minutes. Seven people are watching now. So I stopped and I'm sorry, but uh, can, can I ask for silence, please? Okay. Oh, I ask you all to mute yourself. All right. Hi, I'm sorry. I've had to mute everyone. Uh, whoever wishes to speak, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Mm. Okay, good. Just mute everyone. All right, again. Welcome everyone, good to see so many of you. I'm sorry because of the technical delay. Okay, we learn as we go along. We, this topic is freedom of religion under, under the federal constitution. And uh, this is a topic for all of us to just understand what freedom of religion means under the federal constitution so that none of us misunderstand or create chaos in the way we speak. It is just for our understanding not to argue with anyone, not to criticize anyone, not to put our personal feelings in it. This is what the topic is all about. Just understanding the true freedom of religion under our constitution. As such, I will now introduce our, I will introduce our 
speakers. Uh, every, I think everybody knows Professor, Professor Shah Salim Faruqi. He is the chair, the Tunku Abdul Rahman Chair in University of Malaysia, head honcho of the Fed of the Con of constitutional law. Okay, yes, don't shake your head, Professor. Next is Philip Ko, Mr. Philip Ko. Yeah, why did put so big? Put it off. Uh, Philip Cole, who is not only a constitutional professor, but also who is not only a professional constitutional lawyer, but also an adjunct professor at the University of Malaysia. Last but not least, last but not least is Rita Wong a practicing lawyer, past president of the Catholic Lawyers Fraternity. And of course, our moderator, Philip Golingai. I think most of us know him. He is an editor with our Star Media Group and has been there for a very, very long time because I read all his articles. And uh, he is also coordinating editor of in the Asian News Network. So I think we got quite prominent people talking and enjoy everyone. Philip, over to you. Star Media Group and has been there for a very, very long time because I read all these articles. I, I hear an echo. I, I think there's an echo, you know? Yeah. And then I think maybe somebody is on the YouTube. That's, that's why there's an echo. Uh, I, okay, uh, I think Heidi has what? Hi, everybody. Uh, okay, uh, hi, everybody. We'll have an awesome session. Uh, my question is uh, very simple, actually, uh, and it's uh, for the three panel. Uh, my question is, is there freedom of religion in Malaysia? And I'll start, uh, maybe uh, Professor Shad can answer. Then we go to Rita, and after Rita, Philip Ko. Okay, uh, Professor Shad, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, how many minutes do you want to give me? Lebih uh, kurang, I think we negotiated 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, I see, I see, I see. So basically, uh, you, you want me to make my presentation. Yes, yes. May, may I please... Uh, uh, request that the slides come on. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Philip Gulangai, um, learned panelists, uh, adjunct professor Philip Ko, Rita Wong, um, and of course, uh, Father Greg and distinguished participants. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May peace be upon you all. Ni hao. Wanakam. Kopi wasian. Namaste. Uh, kita. Now, I'm going to speak to you about freedom of religion, a constitutional perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in my view, freedom of religion is the freedom of an individual or a community in public or private, to have religious beliefs and to manifest them in practices and worship and in teachings and propagation. In many respects, freedom of religion is a combination of many separate but linked freedoms, including the following. Next, freedom of speech, of course, freedom of assembly, so that individuals and groups may wish to assemble or march in processions, freedom of association so that individuals and groups may set up and administer an association or organization, freedom to associate and disassociate, for example, to have the right to enter or leave a religion. Um, this is an international provision 
though I know that many countries have limits on this particular aspect of freedom of religion. Then the right to buy and to administer property for religious purposes. And finally, the right to religious education. Now, various aspects of this freedom are protected by the constitution, specifically the following. I want to give you, first of all, the theory of the constitution. Later on, we'll see where the theory and practice uh, have developed a wide height or so gap. Number one, Article 3, Clause 1, though Islam is the religion of the Federation, all other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony. Um, please note that unlike countries like Indonesia, and I don't mean to condemn them, just giving an example. In Malaysia, there is no constitutional list of recognized or prescribed religions. In my view, this is a good thing because uh, if there is no official list, that means that the widest possible range of religions may be allowed to practice. Now then let's look at Article 3, Clause 4. It qualifies Article 3, Clause 1, which declares Islam to be the religion of the Federation. This clause says that nothing in this article derogates from any other provision of the Constitution. So the fact that Islam is the religion of the Federation does not override any other provision of the Parlambaga'an. No right or duty or jurisdiction is conferred or revoked as a result of Article 3, Clause 1. Without doubt, Islam has an exalted position, but the Sharia is not the supreme law of the land, and it is not the litmus test of the validity of any law passed by the federal government or the state governments. There's the famous case of Che Omar Che So, where a drug law was challenged as unconstitutional because it was un-Islamic. And the courts held, the Supreme Court, as it was called at that time, held that the Sharia was not the litmus test or the benchmark for validity the constitution is. Uh, next. Sharia courts exist, but with limited jurisdiction. It is clearly provided in Schedule 9, List 2, Paragraph 1, that the Sharia court shall have jurisdiction only over persons professing the religion of Islam and in respect only of any of the matters included in this paragraph. There is a general misunderstanding that all matters of Islam, all matters of Islam are in state hands and are within the purview of the Sharia courts. That is not correct. The federal constitution outlines, enumerates about 25 areas on which Sharia law applies. And the Sharia law then is uh, created by, is, is, uh, is positivized by the state enactment. So this means that the federal constitution bars the Sharia courts from exercising any powers over or affecting the rights of any non-Muslims. And also it means Sharia courts can exercise jurisdiction only over enumerated areas. If I may just, just give one example um, before I go to the next slide. Let us say I'm a Muslim. I sue another Muslim in the law of torts. I will go to Philip Co, my trusted lawyer, and then we will commence the case in the civil courts, even though both parties are Muslims, the law of torts, let us say defamation, it's not a Sharia matter. It is not one of the 25 topics. So Sharia applies only in 25 areas, primarily of family law. Okay, uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, Article 11, Clause 1. Uh, sorry, Article 8, Clause 2. <laughs> Uh, no discrimination is allowed on the ground of religion. Um, but of course, this provision of Article 8, Clause 2 is subject to significant qualifications because of the special position of Islam in Article 3, Clause 1. Uh, next, Article 11, Clause 1 is perhaps the most relevant article. It basically gives to all persons, um, citizens and non-citizens alike, the right to three things. Number one, the right to profess. Number two, to practice. And subject to 11 clause four, to propagate their religion. 
next um 11 class 2 uh, there is to be no compulsion to support a religion other than one's own in other words uh, one can be compelled to pay a tax um uh, or to follow the the doctrines of one's own religion so in that respect i have to point out that our constitution um does not show tenderness for those who have no religion uh, as far as i know uh, there is not that much prosecution um, i don't know of any cases but nevertheless the constitution uh, at least for non muslims um, um there seems to be um, uh, quite a lot of freedom here muslims will have a problem so atheism agnosticism etc may not be protected by our constitution so no person shall be compelled to pay any tax the proceeds of which are specially allocated to religion other than his own but if it's your own religion you can be compelled to pay this tax next 11 clause 3 every religious group has the right to manage its own affairs to establish and maintain institutions for religious or charitable purposes and to acquire and own property and to hold and administer it next article 12 clause 1 is about education no discrimination on the ground of religion in relation to the rights of students to admission or fees in educational institutions 12 clause 2 every religious group has the right to establish and maintain institutions for religious education however there is some discontent about whether a religious association must be established as a society or as a trust or a company i wish to point out at one time the law was that other than islamic groups all other religions must be set up under the societies act but there is a clear cut decided case now that that would be unconstitutional that religious associations can be set up besides being a society they could be set up as a trust or as a company there is a decided case article 12 clause 3 no person shall be required to receive instruction or take part in any ceremony or act of worship of religion other than his own here again there is a presumption in the constitution that everyone has a religion now in the case of nur liana yasira mohammad nur her father did not want her to receive islamic education in the school because he didn't agree with the way it was taught and what was taught he wanted to teach her at home uh, but um, so he withdrew her from the class as a result she was failed in the subject and could not obtain the certificate uh, he went to the court and he lost the court said the freedom is protection against religion other than your own but if you are a muslim you have to follow the islamic faith and islamic education next one a article 8 clause 2 uh, there can be no discrimination on the ground of religion against employees in the public sector public sector so somehow the constitution uh, doesn't address itself to the private sector in the public sector or in the acquisition holding or disposition of property and in any trade business or profession then article 149 is about subversion um parliament has fairly wide powers to pass laws to combat subversion but a preventive detention order cannot be issued on the ground that a convert out of islam is involved in a program for propagation of christianity amongst malays this is the famous case of Jamaluddin Osman they tron called Joshua Jamaluddin case next the right of non muslims to convert from one religion to another um uh, i think is uh, uh, unlimited however there is one qualification the case of Theo Anghuat versus Kadi Pasirmas a child below 18 a buddhist girl uh, she must conform to the wishes of her parents in the matter of religious faith um she has to wait till 18 i just want to alert you in some countries like the usa there's no question of age 18 the issue is does the child is the child of the age of discretion mature enough to make a decision to understand the consequences uh, fundamental rights do not have to wait till age 18 but in malaysia 
the age 18 applies. Next. Um, now, may I talk now of the limits on freedom of religion? I've taken the liberty to divide them into three categories applicable to all persons, uh, um, or is it two categories, and applicable to uh, three actually applicable to all persons, applicable to non Muslims, applicable to Muslims, applicable to all persons. Article 3, clause 1 says that your freedom of religion must not disturb peace and harmony. So, any religious activity, any activity that would disturb peace and harmony can be regulated. Next, uh, restrictions on freedom of speech in Article 10 would obviously also apply. Uh, to freedom of religion. On the Article 10, um, um, any lawyer will point out the restrictions are quite extensive. Public order, national security, incitement and offense, friendly relations with other states, contempt of court, contempt of parliament, defamation, morality. Then Article 11, Clause 4. This is the controversial one. Propagation of one's religion to others is generally regarded in international law as part of the constitutional, as part of a constitutional right. However, this right is subject to one important limitation, missionary activity. And I'm not talking of Christian missionary activity, no. Any missionary activity amongst Muslims by anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, can be regulated by state law. Under the authority of 11 clause 4, state law may restrict the propagation of any religious doctrine among Muslims. So even if a Muslim were to preach to Muslims, that could be regulated under 11 clause 4. Nine out of 13 state legislatures have passed such laws to regulate um, the uh, propagation of any religion, including Islam, to Muslims. Uh, next one, Article 11, Clause 5. I think this is non-controversial. All religious freedom is subject to three restrictions, public order, public health, and morality. A law enacted in the Article 11, Clause 5 must, however, have a real and not a fanciful or remote nexus with permissible grounds. I'm just giving an example. Uh, uh, you, you can't ban someone from wearing a beard or wearing a tudong or um, uh, wearing a, a cross uh, by saying, oh, this will have implications for public order. I think this is too fanciful. It is too remote. It must have a nexus, a clear connection with the permissible grounds. Next. Uh, does religion include non-theistic creeds such as agnosticism, free thought, atheism, rationalism, Western theory, and international norms support a broad view of religion? But in Malaysian society, um, I'm afraid this is not something that the constitution protects. In fact, we all know our Rukun Nagara, uh, Rukun Nagara's first ideal is uh, belief in God. Next, matters of special concern to non-Muslims. Uh, there are Sharia courts. Actually, Schedule 9, List 2 has an explicit provision that Sharia courts shall have jurisdiction only over persons professing the religion of Islam. However, many Sharia court judges are dissolving non-Muslim marriages if one party converts to Islam. Sharia courts are issuing custody orders that traumatize non-Muslim mothers. In my humble view, um, may I please go back here? In my humble view, if one party is a Muslim and one is a non-Muslim, then it doesn't make sense for the matter to go to the Sharia court. It must go to a court which has jurisdiction over both parties. So uh, I, I think when one party converts to Islam, for the Sharia court to act ex parte, ex parte means by hearing only one party. I, I don't support that. Okay, uh, next one, please. 121 Clause 1A, though enacted for legitimate purposes, um, uh, um, the open-ended interpretation of Article 121, Clause 1A by the civil courts has caused much pain and anguish to non-Muslims in some types of civil disputes, for example, over the religious status of the deceased, as in the case of Murthy 
the Everest conqueror. What is 121.1a? It says that in matters within their jurisdiction, the Sharia courts cannot be interfered with by the civil courts. I think this is, uh, uh, in my view, the motive was, okay, if it comes to Muslim inheritance, Muslim marriage or divorce, uh, the matter must go to the Sharia courts, not the civil courts. However, the problem is that there are obviously issues where uh, the status of the person is in doubt, and then it arouses difficulty as to where the case must go. I, I want to confess to you that uh, in any country where there is legal pluralism, multiplicity of laws, multiplicity of courts, there will always be some such issues where we don't know who has jurisdiction. I know in Saba Saravak, there are native courts, there are Sharia courts, and I know that there are conflicts, though we don't talk about them very much. Also, so painful issues arise when one partner in a non-Muslim marriage converts to Islam and goes to the Sharia court, ex parte, one party is heard only to dissolve the non-Muslim marriage. Of course, the Sharia courts have no objection to hearing the non-Muslim party. But as far as I know, uh, non-Muslims, and rightly so, do not wish to appear before the Sharia courts. So the case proceeds ex parte, and that is not conducive to justice. Okay, next slide. Conversion to Islam to avoid liability in civil marriage. Uh, there is no shortage of such cases, and it is a great disservice to Islam when this happens, that people wanting to escape the bonds of a civil marriage or a civil obligation convert to Islam um, to be subjected to the Sharia rather than to uh, be subjected to their obligation under civil law. Uh, my humble submission is that a non-Muslim marriage contracted under civil law must dissolve under civil law to allow both parties equal rights of audience in the civil court and a fair treatment in a civil court on all ancillary matters. Every marriage involves ancillary matters, property ownership, a nomination of EPF, uh, loans, etc. And I think these should be handled before a civil court. Next, the Herald case, um, also called the Archbishop of Kuala Lumpur case, the Court of Appeal upheld the ban on the use of Kalima Allah in Christian materials. Uh, I just want to say this to you. This has nothing to do with the theory of Islam. This is basically a unique Malaysian situation uh, where um, um, the uh, pressure um, uh, from the public or from some groups um, had its effect on the courts. Um, in Islam, there is absolutely uh, no ban whatsoever on the use of the word uh, Allah by non-Muslims. Uh, actually, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, all the prophets of Christianity and Judaism are also actually recognized in the Holy Quran. In fact, in the Holy Quran, there is a, there is a whole surah, a whole chapter on Maryam, um, Mother Mary. So um, this is a purely Malaysian thing, unique to Malaysia, not uh, applicable in any other Muslim country. But uh, there is a hopeful case, the recent Jill Ireland case by young Arif Justice Norby Arifin, the Jill Ireland case, where she adopts a different approach. She says that Jill Ireland um, uh, was having these uh, materials with the word Allah inside for personal use and uh, not for propagating um, and therefore, it cannot be confiscated or banned. Uh, when it comes to propagation, yes, Article 11, Clause 4 applies. Um, if there is a state law, if not all the states have such a law. Okay, next, next slide. Planning permissions. Um, there is a, a problem here. Uh, request for planning permission are often delayed. Um, and I think this is uh, um, not right. Uh, there should be expeditious uh, approval of planning permissions. However, 
I want to mention to you my personal experience. There is a worldwide phenomena of places of worship being constructed without the requisite planning permission or in trespass of state rights. Uh, this often leads to orders for relocation and on some occasions to controversial moves to demolish the illegally built shrines. I have to say this to you with sadness that uh, um, religious places of worship have um, economic uh, and uh, monetary implications. So many, many people set up these places of worship, um, uh, hoping, planning to benefit from them. So I think we, we need to understand this situation that we can't allow religious places to mushroom everywhere. So this is a worldwide phenomena and I think we need to handle it uh, maturely, but with tolerance. I, I think whenever a town is built, a new township is built, there should be places allocated for all religions and their places of worship. But if it's an illegal illegally constructed. I can understand planning permissions will apply. Okay, next. Uh, thank you. Next one. Next slide. Unilateral conversion of minors under Article 12, Clause 3, the religion of a person under 18 years is to be decided by his parent or guardian. This is the case of Theo Enghuat. However, painful issues have emerged in a number of cases in which a husband is a non, in a non-Muslim marriage, renounced his religion. And for a very long time, for several decades, the courts were saying one parent can determine the religion of the child. And that parent happens to be uh, the Mu'allaf parent, the convert to Islam who has gone to Sharia court. But now we have a very helpful Indira Gandhi case um, of 2019, whereby the court has said that uh, um, um, both parents ha have a right to determine the religion. And I think this is a um, correct uh, decision. May I also point out to you, uh, Philip and uh, Rita will, of course, know. In the 11th schedule, there is an interpretation um, uh, clause. Interpretation clause is um, two brackets 95, which says words in the singular include the plural and words in the plural include the singular. So if it says parent, guardian, it should mean parents and guardians as well. Okay, next. Uh, um, sadly, up to now, um, the civil courts were abdicating, passing the matter over to the Sharia court as to whether the minor is a Muslim or a non-Muslim, but now the Indra Gandhi decision has set things right. I hope and pray that this decision will survive. Next slide. Interreligious marriages involving Muslims are not allowed. Uh, in many Muslim countries, they are allowed, but not in uh, Malaysia. Um, so that means if someone wants to marry a Muslim man or a Muslim woman, um, someone from another religion, he has to convert. So in a way, it is a legally, legally uh, required conversion. It has led to many problems. And the problem is in case the marriage does not last and the divorced convert wishes to revert to his or her form of faith, there are immense problems, immense problems. Coming into the religion is easy. Getting out is a problem. Next. Uh, there's a lot of extremism on the rise. Now and then intolerable acts of insult occur. The government does not deal with them firmly and expeditiously. Um, superior courts, often civil courts disregard Schedule 9, even though the Sharia courts have no jurisdiction over non-Muslims. Occasionally, civil court judges advise non-Muslims to subject themselves to the uh, Sharia courts. And when a non-Muslim refuses, she's left with no remedy. Uh, occasionally, the polemic about uh, Islamic State uh, arises. Uh, my personal view is uh, Malaysia is uh, not an Islamic state. Malaysia is neither a secular state. Malaysia, in my view, is mixed. It's hybrid. It's pluralistic. It is not an Islamic state. 
because Article 4, Clause 1 says, this constitution is the supreme law of the Federation. And any law passed after Merdeka Day, which is inconsistent with it shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. At the same time, it is not a full-fledged secular state, as many lawyers say, because Muslims, and they constitute about 61% of the population now, Muslims are compulsorily subject to the Sharia. So in a secular state, no one is compulsorily subject to the religious law. So it, it requires a willing suspension of disbelief to say Malaysia is a secular state. But at the same time, it is not uh, a theocratic state. There's no need to adopt a black or white, this or that. I think we are somewhere in the middle. Okay, next one. Next slide. Limitations that are of special concern to Muslims. My uh, time uh, is almost up. I've got about three more minutes. Uh, well, there is suppression of diversity in Islam. Much more than for non-Muslims, um, Muslims are subjected to restrictions uh, to stay on the right path. Only the Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jamaa, the officially sanctioned path of Islam is permitted. Actually, diversity is an inherent in Islam as it is in all other religions. In fact, the very fact, and uh, Philip Coe will um, hopefully agree with me on this, the very fact that Islam belongs to the state assemblies means that in a small country with about 20 million, 18 to 19 to 20 million Muslims. There are 14 separate, 14 separate set of Sharia enactments. Each state has its own plus wilaya persecutuan. And there are subtle differences from state to state. So obviously diversity is inherent in our federal setup. But despite the spirit of tolerance and diversity, um, um, the recent trend is that uh, um, only the right path as determined by the state enactments and the state Sharia authorities can be followed. So there is considerable tension about the diversity that exists within the Malay Muslim community. And much of this diversity is driven underground. I've been asked in my class by Muslim students, they have asked me, they say, sir, do Muslims have fundamental rights under the constitution? Or are they all subordinated to the uh, edicts, the commands, the rulings, the fatwas of the Sharia authorities. So I think that's the concern of many Muslims. Next, um, professing the religion of Islam. I'm just pointing it out. Schedule 9, list 2 says, Islam shall apply to those who profess, profess the religion of Islam. But in Maqsud Ahmad, the court says, no, no, no. It's not a question of whether you profess. It's a question as to where you were born. What does your IC say? So uh, the courts are ignoring Schedule 9. They are going by the entry in the IC. And there are problems here because sometimes the entries in the ICs are wrong. I'm told in Saba Saravak, this is a problem. A lot of Sabahans have the word bin inside their name, though they are not Muslims. And Quite often there are cases where in the IC, uh, there is an entry that they are a Muslim. Okay, next. Um, um, the next one, please. I have to rush through. Um, um, offenses against the precepts of Islam. This is a big issue. The states are allowed to punish Muslims for offenses against the precepts of Islam. Now, what do precepts of Islam mean? It has been argued in many courts, many cases, that precepts should be confined to the fundamental principles of Islam. But our courts have, as a rule, interpreted the word precepts very broadly to mean aqidah, sharia, and akhlaat. Aqidah is the creed, the fundamentals of faith. Sharia is the law, and even akhlaq, the morality. So it's defined very, very broadly. In other words, Muslims are subject to very broad power uh, of criminal prosecution by the state authorities. Next. 
Uh, apostasy by Muslims is a, is a real problem. I, I want you to know, uh, please go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, the civil courts approach is this. Under our basic law, a Muslim does have a right to convert, but he cannot do it lit unilaterally. He must obtain a Sharia court certificate of renunciation. And that's where the problem arises. Many Sharia courts sit on the matter. In some cases, they don't just sit on the matter. In some cases, an application to apostate is regarded as an in insult to Islam. So um, this is a, a very, very, though it is a rare situation, nevertheless, it's a very painful situation. Next one. Overview and conclusions, Philip. Uh, I just take two more minutes. I think compared to many other Asian societies, the overall situation of religious tolerance in Malaysia was exemplary till the late 80s. Since then, the calm has been broken by a number of legal, political, and moral dilemmas that defy easy solution. Next, a dissonance between the constitution's promise and society's performance has developed. Islamic theory of tolerance towards and respect of other faiths is not always evidenced in the practice of some Muslim politicians and administrators. On an individual level, there is much harmony um, and friendship. Um, but at the group level, there are undoubted tensions. Some of these tensions are a reaction to the geopolitical situation. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that that's the way conversations go. Muslims around the world are deeply aggrieved by the invasions of innumerable Muslim lands by Western armies. There are massacres, genocides, ethnic cleansing, targeted killings of people of the Muslim faith in Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yugoslavia, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Pakistan, Iran, Sudan, Somalia, Myanmar, India, and parts of China. There is rise of Islamophobia in many parts of the non-Muslim world. Blasphemous cartoons against Prophet Muhammad are defended by many governments as part of free speech. The president of France is famous for making insulting remarks about Islam. The same governments see nothing wrong when Muslim girls in headscarves are victimized, when mosques with minarets are not allowed because that would spoil the skyline. Despite these atrocities, the religious majority in this country has a religious and constitutional duty to protect and restore the rights and freedoms of all communities in this country. Uh, I believe that the ability to live together in peace and harmony is one of the marks of a great civilization. I believe that religious tolerance is the finest test of a tolerant and democratic society. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Shad. Uh, we go next to Rita. Rita, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. I tried to unmute myself. FDA expert here to answer parents' most pressing questions on the vaccine. Hello. Also, the very first thought would be several members of the jury. Okay, can you? Carry on, Rita. She was muted. So. Okay, carry Rita, on. You're Rita. muted. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you, Pimia uh, of the Ascension Church, to afford me this opportunity to give the talk on the understanding freedom of religion under the Malaysia Federal Constitution. Okay, let's look at the freedom of religion or belief under international human rights law and the Malaysian law. What does the hum international human rights law say? Under Article 18 of the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, is clearly stated that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his 
religion or belief. So the freedom of thoughts, uh, freedom of religions does include freedom to change his or her, her religion based on the international human rights law. Okay, the uh, international human rights law expressly guarantee freedom to change. It was, however, it was subject to heated debate. Saudi Arabia did not object to the UDHR but only abstained from voting. Seven other countries from the Middle East voted in favor. Pakistan strongly supported. Pakistan representative in the UN General Assembly say, the Quran expressly say, let he who chooses to believe, believe. And he who chooses to disbelieve, disbelieve. The Muslim religion was a missionary religion, but it recognized the same right of conversion for other religions as for itself, which means it accepts conversion into one religion and it also accepts conversion out of that religion. So let's look at the uh, Malaysian law, the federal constitution, the Article 11. Uh, guarantee the fundamental liberty of the freedom of religion. Every person has the right to profess and practice his religion subject to uh, Article 11, Clause 4. That means uh, the state law or federal law may control or restrict the provocation of any religious belief among Muslims. If it is not regards to the provocation, that means it is irrelevant. So it does not expressly prohibit a voluntary conversion of a Muslim to other faith. Some, some of it has been uh, well mentioned by Professor, I will not repeat. So under Article uh, 12, Clause 4, the religion of a person under 18, that means the minor, a minor uh, religion shall be decided by his parents. So minor do not have the capacity to decide his religion will be decided by his parents. So look at the uh, Che Omar Che So. The federal, uh, federal court said that though Islam is the religion of the federation, it is not the basic law of the land. The basic law of the federation is federal constitution. Article 4. The federal constitution is the supreme law of the federation. Any law which is inconsistent with this, con this constitution shall be void. That means the parliament cannot pass law which is inconsistent with federal constitution. If parliament pass law inconsistent with constitution, shall be void. That law is void. So if, uh, however, in 1988, there is an amendment to the federal con constitution with the Insertion of Article 121, Clause 1A. The civil court shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. So the consequence of this new article is the civil courts refuse to act on conversion cases. So all the conversion cases have to refer to Sharia court. Custody of children denied to non-Muslim parents because you have to uh, it, it is subject to Sharia court. Civil court refused to act in body snatch, snatching cases. So when a Muslim, uh, when the body of a deceased Muslim, it will have to be buried in accordance to the Islamic rights. So the Lina Joy case. Lina Joy born as a Muslim. She embraced Christianity and was baptized. She applied to change her name to Lina Joy. So I see the National Registration Department, the IC department issued her a new IC with a new name, Lina Joy, but the religious status remained as Islam. So Lina Joy applied to remove the word Islam from her IC. The registration department refused because it requests Lina Joy to produce the Sharia court order that she has renounced Islam, then only the uh, registration department will remove the word, IC, the, the word Islam from her IC. Federal court held that 
the civil court do not have jurisdiction, only Sharia court has the, has the power to allow Lina Joy to remove her religious destination of Islam from her IC. This, this is amounting to you want to erase the word Islam from your IC. Lina Joy did not apply to the Sharia court. So she migrated to Australia. She left the country. And why, why not obtain the necessary orders from the Sharia court? We look at the uh, Rivati case. Rivati went to Sharia court to change name and her religious status was arrested by religious authority because this is apostasy. It's an offense. And sent for rehabilitation for six months. After six months, since she refused to return to Islam, her, ch her child, Ribati child, was handed to her Muslim parents while she was subjected to continue counseling. That means the, the, uh, the, the Hindu husband was, who, who is the non-Muslim was denied for the custody of the child. It was handed over to Rivati's parents. Sharia judge. Tell that once a person has embraced Islam, that person cannot leave Islam. She will remain as Islam until she repent. She, uh, she cannot convert out of Islam. So this is akin to one way, there is no U-turn. In Priya Tassani case, Priya was born as a Muslim, converted to Hinduism. She changed her Muslim name in her IC and married a Hindu. Because uh, the, the Muslim cannot marry a non-Muslim. The, the law does not recognize the interreligious marriage. She was arrested and charged for having a child out of a law and for apostasy. Attempted to convert out of Islam. She pleaded guilty in Sharia court, was fined for having a child out of a lot and for apostasy. When she had her second child, she was charged again in Sharia court for having a child out of a lot. She then applied to civil court to declare that she is a Hindu. The civil court held that conversion is the subject matter of the Sharia court. So, civil court does not have jurisdiction to hear the matter. So they have to refer back to Sharia court. This is the, the Mufti case. The Mount, if you still can remember, this is the Mount Everest climber. Sergeant Mufti in coma since November 2005 until his death. In 1st December 2005, one major Supreme informed Mufti's wife that Mufti's have embraced Islam. The wife have no knowledge that Muti has uh, converted to Islam. Upon Muti's demise at KLGH, KL General Hospital, Majlis Agama Islam tried to claim his body because the, the body of a Muslim will be buried in according to Islamic faith, right? So the, the family challenged that the, this was challenged by Muti's family. Majlis Akama Islam applied to Sharia court and get the order that to, to declare that Muti was a Muslim. The order was made without presence of Muti's family. Muti's wife applied to civil court. High court held that no jurisdiction to hear the matter in light of this new article 121 clause 1A. These are the scenes of chaos when the Islamic religious group tries to claim the body of a deceased person who is alleged to have converted to Islam. The family members are left to breathe in more pain. The city Fatima, a Chinese converted to Islam to marry an Iranian man. The man left her. She wanted to convert out of Islam. She applied to the Benin Sharia court, seeking to renounce Islam. Sharia court ordered city Fatima to undergo three months counseling to learn more about the religion with Islamic department. Then the Islamic department will have to submit a report to the court and the judge will decide three months later. 
Shara Court allowed her to convert out and held that she never really embraced Islam. She was never a practicing Muslim. Sam Pei Pei was 17 years old, reported to have converted into Islam without family knowledge. This is an underage, the minor. The minor, we know that uh, the, the religion uh, will have to be decided by the parents. The officer allowed her conversion despite being underage. She found in a religious home, wearing a dudong and her grandmother sought help from MCA. Meta was referred to Benin Religious Department who admitted the error and revoked Sam Pei Pei's conversion as it was done without consent of her parents. So minor, so again, in this uh, Susie Steele case, the Dua and Quartz case, a minor does not have the capacity to choose her religion. It will be decided by the parents. Indira Gandhi's case, Indira married Kamanadan. The marriage was registered under the Law Reform Marriage and Divorce Act 1976, which applied to all Muslim, all non-Muslim. They have three children, minor children, and below the age of 18. In 2009, Pamanadan converted to Islam and changed his name to Riduan. He left their home with their youngest child, Prasanna. The two elder children, Dasini and Denise, continue to live with Indira. However, the husband, Ridwan, converted the three minor children to Muslim without the consent from the mother, Indira. So Indira goes to the high court for review of the conversion of the child, of the, of the children. High court decided that he has the exclusive right to review and cancel the certificate of conversion, Ridwan go to the court of appeal. The court of appeal overturns the high court decision and held that the high court have no power to review a matter of conversion into Islam as that was a religious issue for the Sharia court. So Indira appealed to the federal court. The federal court held that high court have the exclusive power to review and cancel the certificate, the, the certificate of conversion was cancelled. According to the constitution, the word parents means both father and mother if they are alive. It is the unilateral conversion by one parent was invalid. 10 year ordeal to confirm that Indira consent was required before the children could be, could be converted. Conversion from Islam, conversion out of Islam, except for Negri Sembilan, there is no express provision in the state law for a Muslim to convert out. Most state law provides penal consequences for attempting to convert out, which means it, it, is, a, it is considered apostasy and it will draw uh, subject to, it could be subject to imprisonment or fine or rehabilitation sent to the rehabilitation center. Implication of conversion to Islam. Conversion will be registered. Once a person converts to Islam, this conversion will be registered in the IC. The IC will record, will state that, that the person is Islam. Conversion back to your former religion is either not allowed or amount to criminal offense. Punished with fine, whipping, detention, or imprisonment. A Muslim cannot marry a non-Muslim. The law does not recognize inter-religious marriage. If you divorce or attempt to convert out of Islam, you may lose custody of your children because they are Muslim. Implication of conversion to Islam upon death, your non-Muslim relative will lose their rights to any of your property. That means your parents will not, if it is uh, your parents is non-Muslim, will lose the right to inherit your property. You will be buried mm -hmm. in accordance to Islamic rights. Implication of marriage to a marriage to a Muslim, the marriage is not recognized unless both parties are Muslim. 
children of such marriages automatically become Muslim. Non-Muslim parents not be granted custody of children. Non-Muslim spouses have no legal recourse in Sharia court. Thank you. I hope you have learned something from the above presentation. Thanks, Rita. Yeah, it's uh, uh, learning. Le uh, yeah, I was learning a lot. Okay. Uh, and then next we have uh, Philip. Thank Cole you, Rita. To give your points. Thanks, Philip. Uh, Philip Golongai, and thank you for the organizers. Good evening and good morning to others who are elsewhere, brothers and sisters, sharing our common humanity. Preceded by the learned, my learned friend, Chad Faruqi and Rita, I'm contented to share my journey in the last 30 years amongst these cases. Some of these cases, of course, I didn't have a direct journey, but my engagement with it as someone deeply interested in public law. Let me start with the current situation. The current situation we are now still undergoing, the Suhakam hearings of an alleged disappearance of a Malay pastor and an Indonesian wife, Ruth Sitabu. The hearings are not completed yet, so it will be premature for me to comment. But preceding this uh, enforced disappearance hearings, we have, of course, the pastor Raymond Ko and also okay. Saudara Amri Chitmat of Police Hope. In that particular hearing, the chair and the panel, supported by the full panel, held that there are evidence that point to state or state agents procuring the disappearance of these two individuals. This is a startling holding. Obviously, the government disagrees with it. And in a recent United Nations uh, report, they have filed the objection that that finding is not sustainable, but that is merely over United Nations report. There are current cases being filed by these two individuals on a civil suits against the government about the disappearance of these two individuals. My involvement in those hearings tell me that the word painful that is used by my good friend Shad and also Rita is demonstrated deeply in the tears of the family that ask why and where is my husband or the father of my children. These questions reverberate in my mind as I thought back on the time when I was a young lawyer, almost 30 years ago, where Operation Lalang, under the administration of the then Prime Minister, Dr. Mahate, in a swoop against civil society, also detained a number of alleged proselytizers, that's the word they use, eh? proselytization among the Muslim community. And of course, that was the dr draconian law, which is known as the Internal Security Act, which allowed detention up to 60 days, even without communication with your family and scarcely with your lawyer. And then you could be extended for a two year detention period and even beyond that. I remember those days when I traveled up to Kamunting, where there was a detention center. And I remember again, painful tears of wife with young children outside the detention camp, asking why is my husband, why is the father of my children detained in such a manner? Was there any of the activities, a genuine threat to national security and public order, or are they merely professing and practicing 
and even propagating the faith, and as well demonstrated in the exposition by Shad, that three liberty, only the third was circumscribed. And even if it was circumscribed, it is circumscribed subject to state law. And within those state laws, they could be hauled up and punished under civil law. For example, if someone is propagating a non-Islamic faith, and Shad helpfully points out, the Islamic faith definition is actually the Sunni school. Any other teaching that is non-Sunni, which could include even Sufism, and of course, Shiism, and other forms of Islamic teaching, which will also include, of course, Christianity, Hinduism. You can add further isms to that. There is a wide definition. And within those laws, they also prescribe the use of the istila of various sort. And we have also seen how that law and also the way the civil courts ruled on the use of language has reached the apex of our federal court in the Catholic Herald case. But recently, as Chart says, the Jura Island case seemed to draw a distinction about the wide swath of meaning in the control of the use of words. We are aware even from the media that Dewan Bahasa Pustaka even has a definition of the word Tuhan, capital T, and say that it is only in the Provence of the majority community that can use the word Tuhan with capital T. Now, when I say all this, it is not in a kind of a polemic against the majority community. We are aware that the heritage of Islam and the community that is the majority community in our nation has always been a heritage of a Muslim and a Malay. In fact, one of the definitions, and which is the one that creates part of the issue, is Article 160 of our federal constitution that the word Malay is a person professing the Islamic faith speaks the Malay language and practices the Malay customs. So what we have is a enhanced uh, definition that freezes the identity of the majority race. I remember the late Ahmad Ibrahim, my learned dean then, 30 years ago or more when I was in the faculty of law, he did make a remark that of all the communities and citizens in this country, the Malay has the least liberty and freedom of religion. Going back to the days of Kamunting and the Joshua Jamaluddin case, which I was a young lawyer in the courts, we also realized that the power of the state, however, was checked at least in that decision of the late Hashim Yok Sani, at that time, of course, very much alive, he made a clear ruling that mere allegation of threat to national security, not supported by evidence, may not be used as a basis to not permit a person to profess a religion. And in that case, Saudara Joshua Jamaluddin, a Malay, was a Christian, and he was set free by a habeas corpus, which is a writ that allows a person that is unlawfully detained to be released. I remember those days well, when we argued in court and trying to apply the same ruling to another gentleman called Mr. Philip Cheong. It was uphill because there was an appeal to the federal court and the high court judge said that since there's an appeal, he's, uh, he's not too sure, all right, that, of course, in a sense, Joshua case had not reached the federal court then. Uh, but there was this tension. 
Um, and then we applied for bail. And I remember that there was a shock to the federal council when Justice Anwar permitted a bail for that person upon the undertaking of Brother Philip Chong to surrender his passport. Now, those narratives that I'm sharing points to a deeper challenge. One of my clients was Hilmi Mohammad Noor. He was also a, a Malay convert to Christianity and he was detained. Subsequently, he wrote a beautiful testimony book called A Circumcised Heart. At his question, at the detention center, he was always asked, why do you want to give up all the privileges of being a Malay in this country and a Muslim? And our dear brother, Hilmi Muhammad No, merely smiled and continued to avow and affirm his faith in the most gentle fashion. It is interesting, the same special branch officer, then a young officer, was part of the witness in the Suhakam case of Raymond Coe, where it was put to him that that gentleman in the special branch had a special focus on monitoring the religious freedoms of our nation. Going forward, during my days in court and holding a watching brief for the Malaysian Consultative Council of the Non-Islamic Faith, I was privileged to have a front seat view in many of the arguments of the courts. The court in Indra Gandhi, for example, where this brave woman took nine years of her life journeying on through the labyrinthine courts, having a glimmer of hope at the high court in Ipoh, where an order of mandamus was issued against the IGP to produce the child that was snatched cruelly from the breast of the mother. I would never forget the point where she walked out of the court and reporters asked her, why, madam, what, what happened here? And the lady says, I am not a lawyer, but where is my infant child? Words cannot explain the pain and the perplexity of that cry. Despite the victory in the high court, at the court of appeal, it was reversed with only one dissent. Our current Honorable Yang Ahmad Arif Tunku Maimun was the sole lady judge who dissented. That means she permitted that an order should be made to the Inspector General Police to produce uh -huh. the child. It was painful for me to hear the kind of uh, arguments that had to be made falling on judicial years that is not weighing the scales properly. But Indra Gandhi found relief at the highest court of our land. And a lady, young Arif, Tansari Zainon Binti Ali, gave that vindication, which even surprised most of us, and affirmed a powerful doctrine of basic features of our constitution and affirmed that a civil marriage rightfully entered between non-Muslims, a conversion of one of the spouse unilaterally to the dominant faith of our nation cannot itself negate that marriage. That marriage must be unyoked through a civil marriage divorce rightfully to be tabled in the civil courts. And Indra Gandhi also got the orders, which of course still falling on the deaf ears of the police to, to produce the infant child, now grown to be eight or nine years. 
Indra herself personally said to me, she can accept that the child has been raised as a Muslim, but as a mother, she would like and love to embrace her daughter once again. How is it that in a nation of ours where we are committed when our beloved founding father said that forever we would be a liberal democratic state finding its place in an international arena respected by the world, that we could come to a situation when mothers are deprived of their children, where burials, as Rita has shown, create great grief among the community that is mourning because of the desire to bury a person according to a certain ritual. There are contestation also, of course, in the availability of burial places, which has now been commodified, of course, by uh, funeral uh, uh, places and burial places that have been commercialized. It is said indeed, as Shad hinted, that surely one of the important thing about a state is to permit and honor the date and to allow non-Muslims to have places to bury their date too. A nation that failed to respect the date and those who mourn would be a very, very sad and fragile nation. Admittedly, we do acknowledge that in, in this contestation, and I would make a particular political uh, philosophy remark, there is a contestation between what I would call a liberal conception of the individual right and a more communitarian, using a word in a more nuanced way, that needs to accommodate to the passion and commitment of the collective. These debates will persist. And as in my brief journey through the courts, watching brief for the non-Islamic faith community, I have also seen Buddhist woman who born out of wedlock and registered as a Muslim had to spend up to seven years of her life and probably much savings to finally vindicate that she had never been a practicing Muslim. A recent decision again of the federal court led by our young Ahmad Arif Tunku Maimon has also uh, confirmed and affirmed that in such an instance, such a person who has never practiced the Muslim faith and was born out of wedlock, uh, indeed ought not to be fettered in her liberty to have her own life, for example, to marry now a Buddhist, which would not be possible under the old rulings. As I journey through these events, and once again, looking at the pain and perplexity, I ask myself, is Malaysia a place where there is freedom of religion? The answer is both yes and no. In many, many aspects, yes, most of our community of faith are permitted to have houses of worship. We, can, we are allowed to have our holy books, save and accept in the controversial issue of the use of the kalima, the Allah term. We are allowed, of course, and that remind me, under the Catholic Herald case, one of my learned senior lawyer friends, uh, Manjit Singh Dillon, stood up in court during the Catholic Herald case uh, even though he was watching brief in that case, and I was one of the counsels. And the federal court judge wanted to ask him to sit down because he is not given permission to speak. But he says, my Lord, I, I need to speak because under the Sikh religion, the invocation and address to God as Allah is also found in the holy books. And so much to the... Uh, not too uh, pleasant uh, presiding judge. He kind of say, well, we are not ruling on that now. We're listening on about the Catholic Herod case. So ladies and gentlemen, I do not wish to uh, dominate uh, further. 
uh, the conversations and maybe we should open up for uh, uh, robust questionings and our reflections can be enriched in that manner. One of the questions posed, and maybe I shall tackle that, why is it that most of these issues seem to revolve around the uh, issue of Islam and other faith and not others? Well, not quite true, isn't it? Huh? There are issues among other communities sharing together and having tensions about the practice of their faith. For example, my Hindu friends and brothers are also unhappy uh, if there are aggressive Christian evangelism or proselytization, which in some exuberant uh, manner of doing so, uh, seek to be iconoclastic, using the word in its literal sense, uh, breaking of idols and creating grave threat to public order. I must also draw attention to the penal code of our country, where under chapter 15, offenses relating to religion, there are uh, offenses about injuring and defiling places of worship, disturbing religious assembly, trespassing in burial places, and then a very important section indeed, uttering words with deliberate intent to wound the religious feelings of any person, and 2298A, which discusses also issue of kafir mangafir. I won't go into unpacking this. In conclusion, I also like to make a comment about public health provision and qualification. This is a lively issue, uh, brothers and sisters, because on mandatory vaccination, there are communities of faith, which could include the dominant one, and some uh, evangelical Christian, of which I belong in the community, but I don't, I don't hold that view, of course, all right? Uh, analogous to the Jehovah Witness issue, meaning parents refusing to give permission for vaccination as a affront to the tenets of their faith. I find this debate extremely interesting. Now, this is not something we brush aside. I'm talking to people, of course, of varied religious backgrounds. I know of friends from the Hindu faith and Christian faith and Islamic faith who resist vaccination, especially those that uses the RNA, all right? Saying that it disturbs the DNA, which is our God-given genetics. Now, I won't be able to unpack this and maybe I'm giving an advertisement. There will be in November a medical legal ethics forum where these issues will be ventilated. But there we are brothers and sisters, the whole sphere of freedom of religion straddles not only about detention or enforced disappearance, which is very, very painful indeed. And this is unlawful to my mind against the fundamental liberties of other tenets of freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, and a freedom of uh, unlawful detention. We must also recognize, all right, in these debates, the intersection of these. The, uh, freedom of speech, books being banned, sisters of Islam struggle to vindicate some of their books. Faisal Tarani uh, writing, writings were banned until the court declared that it is not uh, it, it goes against the constitutional right and freedom of speech. Time does not permit me to unpack many of these issues, but in our desire to live together, in our desire to harness the energies of the next generation, it is all our prayer, isn't it, that we could engage in this issue rational, consensus, and I hold to that view of a Rawlsian concept, John Rawls, the foremost 20th century political philosopher, that our arguments should meet the bar of public reason. And we should live in harmony and civility in engaging in these issues. These issues will continue to persist, whether it is 
custody, burial, or birth, or identity, our Borneo brothers have a deep issues of many being registered to the dominant faith, even though they have never practiced that for the last four generations. These issues are persistent. But Malaysia and the dream of a pluralistic society which Shad and all of us dream about must find ourselves embracing our commitment to our federal constitution. And my favorite finishing word would be, there's one patriotism that we must embrace, constitutional patriotism, a love for a liberal space. Maybe you don't want to call it secular. Maybe you call it more accommodationist, more communitarian, but still liberal democratic space so that our children's children will find peace and grace and harmony living together. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks so much, Philip. Uh, my next question is, um, it's up on this issue. It might be a, uh, maybe you all have answered it, but uh, uh, when I shared this uh, session with uh, people on FB, I think this is the most popular question that uh, they wanted to know. So I will ask this question. Can a Malaysian convert out of his religion? Uh, we start with Shad, then we go to Rita, and then uh, we go to Philip. Thanks. Shad, please. Yes, I, I think the issue, Philip, has already been um, covered when it comes to non-Muslims. As far as I know, there are no bars to their, uh, no legal bars to their conversion uh, from Christianity to any other religion or into Christianity. But when it comes to Muslims converting, as Rita correctly pointed out, except for the state of Negri Sembilan, where there is a grace period during which they will try to win the person back, in most of the states, it is regarded as a crime. Now, how Rita, uh, the state law um, can harmonize with the decision in Lena Joy, I don't know, because in Lena Joy, there is also this belief that you can, but not unilaterally. But the state enactments may well be unconstitutional in that respect. So for Muslims, clearly, there is uh, an existentialist problem. It is clearly a problem, uh, even if uh, um, Lena Joy says you can, but only if you go through the courts. There are a sprinkling of cases, Philip where the court was satisfied that the child was never a uh, Muslim. Uh, Philip Ko gave that example, born to a Buddhist mother, uh, brought up as a Buddhist, but the father was a Muslim and the court said, uh, uh, recently the court said the ch child is not a Buddhist. But in general, it is a, as Rita said, it's a one way road with no U-turns allowed. <laughs> uh, Rita? Yeah, uh, you can convert out of a religion so long as there is no apostasy law imposed. Uh, I think if you can convert out unless you are not a practicing Muslim, you will never embrace Islam, then you can convert out. And either the registration in the IC is by mistake or the conversion uh, is a minor without the consent of parents. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rita. Philip? My reading of the Article 11, which is helpfully put up by Shad, every person, and Shad made an excellent point, is not just a citizen, but person. So migrant, refugees have a right to practice their religion. Person would include a Malay and a Muslim. That's my submission. Now, obviously, state laws can control the practice and propagate the pr propagation, right? Now, if a, a Malay decided on himself on reading the holy books of Buddhism or Hinduism, let's not just talk about Christianity, all right? Decided he wants to embrace, all right? Now, obviously, we are now entering not so much the law. There is this 
existential is a threat, but there's an existential anxiety among the dominant community that the glue that holds them together is not just race. They would have to use religion. This is where political institutions has now garrisoned themselves to use this to protect their homogeneity, which has now been split heterogeneously. All right. We all know that the word Malay and Muslim has a whole diversity of meaning, even among the electorate. And this has caused to reverse, uh, in a different way, uh, Shad's point, existential anxiety among the ruling elites. And institutions are being used to then not permit it. Now, the problem is, when we talk as lawyers, the reality on the ground, the reality of trying to get your IC change, it is a powerful uh, uh, issue. Many of us, when the birth cert is issued for our children or grandchildren, it can carry a faith that is alien to what we are practicing. All right. So it's not just about a Malay converting. We, I, I have in my own experience, I'm now a grandfather and my grandson was registered as a Buddhist. And so I may be soon taking up a case and I may need to instruct Rita Wong to apply to say that my grandson is not a Buddhist. But never mind, that's just a, 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 a sharing, uh, Philip, I'm just trying to say to you. I would say that normatively, Article 11 says even a Malay may convert out. But in the practical terms, given the constraint of institutional civil service, all right, and the NRIC department and the Sharia authorities, we would have that person would have a tremendous uphill task to achieve that goal of allowing himself to be no longer designated of the Islamic faith. Okay, uh, thanks so much. We got, uh, we got 20 minutes. So I think what we do is we open the question uh, to the public. I saw Teresa will ask the question, but I saw one very interesting question here. Uh, the question is... The question is how how about if a Muslim, um, uh, no, do the Malaysian Sharia court have jurisdiction over foreign Muslims living in Malaysia? Maybe Shad, you can uh, try this one and then the rest. Yeah, sure. By there's Frankie, no, the question yeah, is by Frankie. Yeah, yeah, there's no problem there. I, I'm I'm sure the Sharia court will have jurisdiction over all Muslims, no matter where they are from. I have okay. no problem with that. If they are a Muslim, they are subject to the... Uh, just like uh, the police, the road traffic act will apply to everyone, <laughs> no matter where he's from. Uh, when you go to another country, you are subject to the laws of that country. Oh, okay. Philip, you want to add something? That's an argument, uh, Shah. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. Huh? Of course, the argument was dismissed in the Ayapins case, right? Yeah. The Ayapins case, which is the... Uh, the cattle religion, right? Uh, so you have a situation where the person say, look, I'm no longer a Muslim under your definition of the Sunni school, all right? I, I'm involved in some form of a deviant variance. Yeah, so yeah. if I'm not a Muslim, I cannot be subject to the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, obviously, uh, the courts didn't take that too kindly, but just philosophically to argue that I mean, I'm not saying it can be won in the courts. It is quite an interesting uh, issue, all right? If I'm no longer, uh, just like if I'm no longer practicing as a Christian, can I be pulled up in some ecclesiastical Christian court? Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that, why should I be? I'm no longer a Christian, all right? Now, it may well be the actual practice in our country. That argument will be dismissed, but in terms of legal logic and argument, there's some force to that, I would say, all right? It ought, of course, it ought not be, be used cynically. And I know that there's always this problem. Huh? A Muslim or, 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 or is caught uh, drinking and then he says, well, I'm not Muslim, all right? Please don't charge me, all right? Oh. right? So that probably, what, what, what making it feel very, very uh, deeply uh, uh, troubling to the courts that you must not allow 
someone to say, I'm renouncing my faith and therefore you have no jurisdiction over me. Uh, but, but in a genuine case of conversion, I, I would find that there's some force in that argument. Anyway. Yeah, no, Philip, Philip Gulanga, can I just clarify? Yes. I, must have, I must have misunderstood your question. I thought you were saying are non-citizens subject to the law, Sharia law. Yeah. 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 Of course no, they are. Of course they are. Non-citizens, whether they are but Phillips is talking about something else. Philip is saying right, once yeah. a person has renounced, uh, then then I would agree with you. Yes, the, the question was uh, non is a foreigner actually. Okay, Rita, uh, foreigner. Want... Foreigner is subject yeah. to the law. Yes, uh, Rita, do you have anything to add? Yeah. <laughs> if, if you are in Malaysia, you will be subjected to Malaysia law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <I> <laughs> Okay, I've got, I've got an, another question. It's by Makina, and it's the question is, how about if a Muslim, Malaysian Muslim, lah, I, I think that's what she means, or he means, immigrated to another country and holding permanent citizen, and is, is the person considered as illegal to enter to Malaysia again and will be fined under Sharia court? I, I think you get the picture of that question. No, Philip, I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I, I think I think what Makina means is just say the Muslim uh, has migrated, okay, oh. and then maybe converted or something. Oh, I see. I see. He or she, I, I'm assuming, uh, and if he and she uh, returns to Malaysia, uh, is it? I mean, uh, can can that person be fined under the Sharia court for converting? I think it's like the uh, it's a bit like Anita Sarawak actually. I think <laughs> roughly. Uh, Shad, you want to try this? Yeah, yeah. No. Um, if the person returns, then he falls, he or she falls under the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. And yes, the whole law of apostasy will come into the picture. Um, I, I'm, I would be very unhappy with this situation because actually, um, if something had happened abroad and recognized abroad, for example, a marriage took place abroad, but uh, again, talking of the practicalities which Philip Co pointed out, the entire establishment will go after this person from the civil service to the registration department. They'll probably subject the person to the, to the laws of the land to say, all right, you are back here. Uh, welcome. And uh, here is the summons. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I didn't see the uh, further uh, point that she made. Uh, this person, she left Malaysia, converted to another religion because she married an American and she returned. So, Philip, uh, Ho, will she be charged under Sharia court? Oh, Philip, I mean, clearly, domestic laws seldom has extraterritorial reach. That's why we have situations, again, one of the pain, where there are genuine people who want to embrace the faith and genuinely, not because they just want to get married, but they, like Lina Joy, you know, she, she fell in love with a Catholic uh, colleague in the bank and genuinely at age early 30s, and she wants to set up her own life, right? A family. Uh, and, and finding that it is not possible, she has to migrate and she has, she has left the country. Uh, we have here of cases of people going to Singapore, all right? Uh, but does that mean that only upper class or people who can afford, I'm not saying Nina is upper class, huh? I'm just saying that who can afford to travel can escape this uh, restriction. Answer is yes, no laws like the domestic law like that can extra territorial reach. But the moment that extra territorial reach ceases and the person returned back to the jurisdiction of where the person is subjected to the law, that is the principle. Yes, that person could be hauled up for apostasy, could be like Rita's very painful case, the name I escapes me, that uh, giving birth to a child, she could be charged for having a child out of wedlock. She could even be charged for uh, 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 extramarital sex uh, uh, with a non-Muslim, right? Uh, these issues are, are, are very, very real and persistent. So the short answer is that person may and will and can be subjected to the laws of our land when a person returns. Okay, Rita? Yeah, I think this is like uh, akin to Lina's Joyce. If Lina Joyce come back, yeah, she could be subjected to the apostasy law, could be charged under the apostasy. 
Okay, I, I have this question by Sylvia D. Her, her question is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, is, is the only way for a, a Malaysian Malay to convert, convert out of Islam by leaving the country or by migrating out of Malaysia? That, uh, that's her question. Yeah, well, um, sadly, the situation at the moment is this, that uh, uh, conversion out of Islam is almost impossible, except possibly in, in extreme circumstances. Uh, and I suppose uh, the Lena Joy example is there. Uh, yes, I'm afraid, cannot say anything very optimistic here, Philip. Okay, Philip? We are not here to discuss Islamic theology or history, uh, but there is some argument that, yes, I think a community of faith have a right to protect itself against the threat of their identity. Uh, I'm, I'm ranging a bit further than your question. Eh? Uh, but a private conversion where the person is not attempting to go and threaten the whole community, uh, I think there should be a space for discussion. And only among Muslim theologians, this should be discussed, all right? Uh, not outsiders like us, we didn't become outsiders. We can give our views. We only hope that as the Muslim faith faces the whole issue of globalization, of the demand of inclusivistic thinking and embrace of the other, that they will engage this with the tools available to them, both in their civilizational history and not just narrowly uh, paralyzing it on a moment of, you, you get what I mean, Philip? Huh? I, I'm trying to, to push the boundary of the discourse a little bit, but there are tremendous challenge on apostasy. Let, let, let's be fair, and I'm not trying to just, you know, uh, at the height of the dominance of uh, our own faith, whether it's Catholic, uh, Spain, or, or dominant uh, Protestant uh, uh, country, there are a tremendous resistance also against apostasy or even Jewish faith, right? Uh, for those of us who watch Netflix, we, we see those uh, interesting movie called Orthodoxy or, or Orthodoxy, whatever you call them. Uh, the tension found in these individuals, normally women actually, uh, who want to escape <laughs> the conservatism of their Hasidic faith. These issues in a, a early 21st century liberal uh, space we're looking at will persist, all right? Uh, despite what Marx think that religion is going to uh, disappear like opium and the liberal state will wither away religion, uh, the passions and the uh, dominance of uh, a religious identity, uh, the, the battle of identity, all right, uh, is going to persist. I mean, to me, one of the uh, weakness of liberalism is their inability to engage in this discourse and come to a point where we could agree with our religionist uh, uh, brothers and sisters, a space that we can coexist, all right? A space to even allow exit and entrance of a religion without that pain and perplexity that we talk about. Rita? Yeah, under the current situation, if you are practicing Muslim, convert out from Muslim faith is almost impossible unless it is under Negri Sembilan, under Negri okay. Sembilan state. Okay, uh, I've, I've got this last question, then I'll pass it to Teresa. Uh, Stephen, I think, Stephen asked this question. Can a Muslim who is not a Malay, for example, Indian or Chinese, who converted to another religion, uh, can, can that can that person convert to another religion, just say Christian, Hindu, or Buddhist legally? I mean, it's a variation of the question, but it's specific because that Muslim is not Malay, but a Mus uh, a Muslim who is Indian Chinese convert. Uh, maybe uh, Rita, you can uh, answer Rita. this question, and then I think we're done. Uh, just Rita, and then we go to uh, Teresa. I think under the uh, federal constitution, it actually defined the Malay. Who is the Malay? The Malay is a person who profess the religion of Islam. Then you speak the Malay language and conform to Malay custom. 
If you are not an Islam, you are not a Malay. It is but, it is bind together. If you yeah, are a Malay, that, if the minute you convert out of Islam, you are no longer considered as a Malay. This is no, but, mean. no, the question is just say you are Indian Chinese who, who is a Muslim. Bangladeshi, let us say. Yes, Bangladeshi. Bangladeshi okay. Yeah. Can, can you can convert be. to another religion? I think Shad is shaking his head. We got the answer. It's a no, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, the the law, the law relating to yes. apostasy yes. will apply. It okay. applies to all Muslims, whether Malay Muslims or Chinese, or it applies. Okay. Okay. That's, that's the way the law is. I'm not saying that's the ideal situation. Yeah. But yeah, I'm saying that's the. I have, slight, I have a slight different view. All right, I, I'm not disagreeing that the reading of the word Muslim does not mean that it's a Malay Muslim, but the reality is. If you are non-Malay, if you are Indian Muslim uh, or, or a Chinese Muslim, all right, and you seek to leave, I think you have an easier path, all right. I'm not saying that it's so simple to get it, all right. Uh, it is easier, as I shared, the desire of the ruling elite to control using religion, the dominant race, ethnic group, uh, is overweening. Somehow, if you are not a, a, a Malay, uh, you find that even the courts look at it a bit more space for it to, to, to give that remedy, you know? Uh, and, and if you come to go to a civil service, again dominated by the community, fill up the civil service, if you are not a Malay, they somehow do not treat it as serious. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that they won't, uh, depending on the department you go to or, or, or the particular state, all right? So I have a slight qualification, not disagreeing with the normative reading, but the actual practice, I think there is a certain gentleness towards non-Malay Muslims converting. Yeah, okay. the, law, the law doesn't distinguish between Malay Muslims and non-Malay Muslims, but you're right. In practice, the courts may show more uh, receptivity to a fundamental right demand from a non-Muslim. Uh, from okay. a non-Malay, from a non-Malay. Okay. Uh, okay, we have uh, seven uh, more minutes. I leave it to Teresa. Teresa, uh, any questions from your side? Yes, okay. there's only there's only one question here from Stephen. It's a here he is asking how difficult. Okay, the question is how difficult is the process for a previously non-Muslim person who had converted to Islam due to marriage purposes and wants to convert back to his original faith. How difficult is the process involved? Uh, Professor Shah, Filippo, who, which of you want to answer him? It's a similar comment that we make. It's a similar to, I mean, it, in a sense, once you're converted in, you cannot exit in the normative rules in the Sharia law and the Sharia uh, state laws. Uh, again, if you are Chinese or Indian or, or some other race and you converted to marry, there is a certain uh, leniency when they, when you actually apply latitude. A latitude, yes. the proper word, latitude. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for the rescue. A certain latitude uh, to consider your your claim. All right, and and to permit you to uh, to obtain that certificate of. Uh, exit whereby you can then apply to the NRIC department to then change uh, your IC uh, and be not designated as Islam. Uh, but yes. again, it is a long process. Family law uh, faces these challenges. Uh, and, and as Shad hinted to, uh, even in succession issue, all right, uh, uh, property rights, these issues and the intersection of the legal system. Uh, uh, are still uh, uh, unclear in some ways, right? Uh, and still will need judicial handling in the future. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, we got five more minutes. Uh, maybe we let uh, Professor Shad wrap up uh, your thoughts, and then Rita, and then we end with uh, Philip. Okay. Quickly now. Very quickly. Okay. I I I want to uh, uh, say this to you, uh, Philip, that surely. The cup of liberty is not full to the brim, but it is not empty. And I, I'm a little bit sad, actually, at uh, this evening's discussion 
that it tended to concentrate too much on painful issues um, of uh, apostasy. There is much more to religion, freedom of religion in this country. Uh, I think Philip beautifully pointed that out. There's much more to religion than, than that. As I mentioned in my uh, presentation, there are three aspects, at least three, there may be more. Profess, practice, propagate. And actually when it comes to profess, when it comes to practice, when it, I think they are quite satisfactory. We, uh, Philip very correctly pointed out the penal code actually takes a stand against uh, offenses against religions. Uh, there's a sprinkling, sprinkling of good decisions judicial decisions, uh, festivals are celebrated, missionaries, priests are allowed to enter this country. In many of our hotel rooms, there are in the, in the drawers, you can find a copy of the King James Version uh, of the Bible. So, um, and, and, and Philip, oh, perhaps the last thing that I want to mention, there is as far as I can tell, compared to many other Asian countries, no religious violence. You know, in some countries, communal violence is widespread. We may not love each other, but we don't kill each other. <laughs> and I, I think all in all, all in all in this country, uh, as I said, the cup of liberty is not full to the brim, but it is not empty. And, and it would be wrong actually to concentrate simply on the issue of apostasy as the litmus test of uh, freedom of religion. Okay. Uh, thanks, Professor Shad. Uh, Rita, please. Just now, the, uh, the question is also asking about converting into the Islamic faith, you see? It, it is, if converting into the Islamic faith is quite easy, you just uh, declare the two, uh, speak the two clauses of the affirmation of faith before two witnesses. Basically, it will be, you have to declare that there is no uh, there's only one God, Allah is the God, and then uh, uh, Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad is yes. the last messenger. Yes. Yeah. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, uh, okay thanks. thanks. Okay, I'd, I'd like oh. to say this. Um, okay. Justice is found upon the rule of law. Every citizen is equal before the law. Fundamental liberties are guaranteed to all citizens. This yes. includes liberty of the person, equal protection of the law, freedom of religion, rights of property, and protection against banishment. Malaysia prides herself among international community on being multi-religious and multi-ethnic country. There should be no discrimination on ground of race and religion. We should always at all times promote unity, peace, and harmony, and respect for one another. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Uh, Philip? for ably moderating and my fellow panelists and the organizers. I just want to read from the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right, you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people. Yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family. I would say not just of believers. The family, the family. of Malaysia. All right? Uh, we yearn for that image that Ismail Yaakov talks about Kloanga. I know it can be a mere political platitude, but beyond our yearnings, someone had posted, do we have hope? Yes, we journey in hope. But the Apostle Peter also reminds us, fear God with reverential fear. Honor the emperor. We honor the kings and the people who rule over us. We honor their office, even though some of them do not deserve to hold the office. All right, <laughs> because we live in peace and harmony with people, but we are enjoined to fear God. And there are lines that can be drawn where we fear God. We do not fear the power of the state, but we live in harmony and respect for the state. 
Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Shad. Thanks, Rita. And thanks, uh, Philip Ko. It was an honor to moderate this uh, session. Now we pass it to Teresa. Thanks so much. Teresa. Same. No, it's okay. Ah, okay. It's all right now, clear. Are you okay? Are we okay, Philip? Okay. Let me just set if you want to say a few words, okay? Well, thank you to all the speakers. And of course, our moderator for the most interesting and insightful sharing of understanding freedom of religion under the Malaysian federal constitution. I'm sure not only us, but our participants present here on the on Zoom and also those who've managed to go through on the YouTube have now have a better understanding of the laws reg re regulating freedom of religion and the relevant is the and the irrelevant irre issues that were discussed. Mm -hmm. Kindly forgive us, everybody, the speakers and our participants for the technical issues which we experience today. We will learn as we go along, but we ask to be forgiven, especially for the ones who registered but could not join in. I just hope that those who couldn't join in on the Zoom managed to join in on the YouTube. Once again, thank you to our panel speakers. Emirate Professor Datut Shah Farugi, Adjan Professor, Adjung Professor, Philip Ko, Rita Wong, our practicing lawyer, and of course, Philip Golungai, our moderator. Without you on the panel, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we came out to achieve. We didn't seem to have very much questions coming through on the chat, but it's, I think it's simply because our speakers were very clear in what freedom of religion in Malaysia truly means, and also, was very clear in their elaboration of the differences in the practices of the various religions and the changes involved. Thank you so much for condescending to be with us here tonight to help us understand what really is freedom of religion. Okay, I think uh, Teresa's, Teresa's uh, got, I think, technical problem. I we, I think, Philip, we can end uh, the session. Okay. Yes. I think Teresa's uh, frozen for one reason or another. <laughs> uh, okay, please allow me to yes. thank everyone. Thank you for your presence here and God bless you. The purpose of this is organized by the Church of the Assumption, Pamea Parish Ministry, of ecumenical and inter-religious dialogue. And the purpose was this was to promote dialogue, peace, and unity. I hope our talk has achieved that purpose. And uh, yes, we look forward to more and more forays into this area. May God bless you all abundantly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.